In this video, we are going to go over a basic vocal mixing chain. This video isn't intended to dive into the details of all the little things we can do in vocal mixing. Instead, what this video is, uh, it's intended to give you something that works every single time. Every time you want to approach a vocal, these are the things that you could do to make it sound really good every single time, all right? Um, and when it comes to vocals, obviously we can record vocals and then we have editing vocals. And so recording involves like singing into a microphone. So if you're doing your own recording, I actually have YouTube videos on this. And then editing would be, for example, time correcting the vocal, getting it aligned time wise. And then pitch correction would be like auto tune and melodyne. And so these, t these are not what we're talking about in this video. This is obviously something that would happen before. And so if you recorded your own vocals, if you got vocals from Fiverr, if you're using a vocal from Splice, if you're using an acapella online, we're assuming that that's what you have in your session right now. Like I have right here, I have this vocal. And now what we're going to be doing is mixing. So we have the vocal. Um, and now what we want to do is just make it sound good inside the track. All right. And so what we're going to do is do a vocal chain and a chain is just a series of plugins that are going to basically make the vocal sound better. And so let's just start going through the chain. Here is the vocal that I'm going to be working with in the song that I'm working on. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. In the track. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. All right. And so, yeah, we're going to try to make that sound better. And so the first thing that we could do is use what's called a gate. And by the way, this is pretty much what we're going to be going through this whole rack. And uh, so I made it with Ableton only, and I'm going to make that available for you to download. Of course, if you use Ableton, but if you use anything else like FL Studio Logic, then of course you could just recreate what we're doing here in um, using whatever plugins you have and you can save it in logic. I know you can save channel strips in uh, Ableton here. Obviously we can save audio racks, FL studio, not 100% sure, but you could follow along for sure. Cause this is all very basic stuff. First thing we're going to do is get a gate. All right. So we're going to get a gate and uh, so a gate is uh, interesting because it's kind of like a, a compressor but what a gate does where it, if the signal goes above the threshold so this line right here is the threshold in a compressor if the signal goes above the threshold then uh, the compressor turns that signal down that's just simply the way that a compressor works signal goes over the line compressor pushes it down but with a gate a gate also pushes sounds down, but it's when the sound goes below the threshold. So when the sound goes below the threshold, then the gate will push it down. Okay. And so this is really important if you have a noisy vocal, maybe like an old acapella. And so if we listen to this one, for example, million in the bottom. Oops, let's turn the gate off. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the So you can hear that there is like delay in between these vocals. There's some reverb. This is obviously a vocal that has a reverb and delay and other kinds of effects on it. I don't mind those, but uh, if I did want to get rid of them, I would use a gate. And so a gate is typically going to be the first thing in the mixing chain because it gets rid of all the mud that's pretty much in between the vocal. Another thing you could do is just manually go through and just delete the spaces in between. But obviously a gate makes that process automatic. So for a gate, what I like to do is just set it to negative 40 here. And that's real low. So anything a vocal should not be going down to negative 40. And so it's really just going to cut away any noise um, floor down there. I like to also have a pretty fast attack, slow the release down a little bit. So it's a little bit natural. Maybe we'll do like 60 milliseconds, maybe even a hundred milliseconds could work. Why is that one second? Okay. Yeah. hundred. There we go. And then the floor, just turn it down to infinity. And so basically what this floor here is, is how much is it going to be turned down? And so anytime the sound book goes below the threshold here, then it's going to be turned down to minus infinity. All right. And so to the moon, so let me turn this up so we can hear kind of what the gate does to the moon. I'm turning the threshold up to the moon and you boys can't stop it. And so you can see this is the dynamic envelope um, of the vocal. And so to the moon and you can hear the, the stuttering because what happens is 
to the moon. These little spots right here that dip below the line, those get brought down in volume. And you can see the gain reduction meter right here. To the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack about a million in the bottom of a rocket taking off. All right, but again, I'm just going to drop this to 40. And to be honest, I don't even mind the effects that are in this vocal. I had a cough for a second, but don't mind the effects that are in this vocal. So I might as well just turn this off. But a gate is a great thing to start the chain with, because uh, if you have something noisy, you could just simply take it out. All right. Um, and then here I wrote Arvox. Um, I'm just going to quickly cover this, but Arvox is what I would personally use for my gate plugin. It's very simple. Um, right here this is just it's literally one knob it already has all these kind of taken care of and it's a pretty gentle gate like you don't need to be crazy with this but it does just clean it up to the moon and you boys can't stop it stack the bottom million in the box but again like i said for this it, it's just literally this one on the left here it's it's is it just sets the threshold that's it and so anytime the signal drops below this threshold then rvox is going to turn it down and pretty gently pretty slowly um and so that is that just setting up the gate the next thing that we would do is de-essing okay and so de-essing is where we have s's in the uh vocal and s's can be very harsh especially when we compress the vocal which we're going to do in this video we compress the vocal and then bring it up or bring it forward in the mix we could bring up those harsh s's and make it even more grating and piercing in the ears so we want to control the s's the high frequencies because we don't want to make people's ears bleed so ableton actually has a um what's it called ds setting uh preset here in their library from the compressor um, although the weird thing is that I don't think that they set it up correctly, um, which is now I could be wrong about this, but I, I don't think that I am. But if we just come over to the deesser, the way that deessers work is you tell the compressor to listen for high frequencies. So S's, so around like 7K to up to like 15K, that range is what you tell the listen to li uh, tell the compressor to listen for and when it hears spikes in that range it triggers compression and so what happens is if we zoom in for example to an s let's see get taken off to the moon and you boys can't okay so can't stop it right here right that's an s and so what happens is if the compressor hears this is going to turn the the volume down like a compressor would okay and the great thing about that is it's just simply going to only turn down the S's because it's only listening for that frequency range. So it only turns down the S's right here. The problem with um, Ableton's is that it has a weird um, detection here. So inside the compressor, you can turn on the side chain, but you don't need to turn on the side chain. You could just have the EQ enabled because the EQ is going to tell the compressor we're only going to be listening to a specific area of the vocal. And so what we want to do, and if I listen, turn on the audition feature here. Stop it. Okay, listen to this. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million. I see what they're doing. So this is a bell filter. So what they're going to do is they expect you to turn this up. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the Okay, but what I prefer to do, and that makes sense now, but what I prefer to do is really just isolate the top end. So instead of having a bill filter, a bell filter i like you using a bandpass filter so now when we're still listening to the audition uh we can go try to find those harsh frequencies in the bottom of a you know usually right around 7500 is a good starting point in the bottom sorry if that's a little bit harsh in the bottom of a off to the moon. but you can hear when he says t or when he says s is just a spike and you can see it right there Take, take, okay, can't, and then stop it is, is, isn't that harsh. But, okay, so what we could do is turn off that, turn off the, uh, I'm sorry, turn off the addition. Million in the bottom of 
And so now I could just set the threshold. Now that the compressor is only listening to those high frequencies, I could set the threshold so that I can just make sure that this de is only bringing down those uh, high frequencies, those S's. Billion in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon. And you, you can see it right there. Take, take, right? So it's capturing those harsh frequencies with the T sound. T Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. And so right there it's getting those S's. So you can see it's getting the two T's and the S's. And those are exactly what I want to compress. And so that is basically what a de does. It literally de-S's or takes the S's down, the high frequencies, the harsh frequencies in the vocal. So that way when we use compression and we bring the vocal up, we can make sure that those S's aren't disproportionately loud. Million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you okay so that is how you could do it in ableton's my preferred de would be from um fab filter so that would be pro ds this thing is literally just set it and forget it and there should be a, a video on de-essing a de deep dive somewhere in the course um could be in the mixing bonuses but um, I'll put a link to that below this video. Million in the bottom. But you'll see that with Pro DS here, it's going to light up in the waveform display here. It's going to light up the S's in green. And then on the right, you're going to see the gain reduction here. Uh, but you can see right here, the way that this works is we have the detection circuit here. So this is detecting what frequencies are we listening for. And then that's when we turn down the vocal. So you'll see this light up in green here when it detects the S sound. And you'll see the gain reduction it'll turn it down over here million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it so take take stop stop you see that million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it so i mean ttss all right there you go see it's just detecting those harsh frequencies and then it just turns those down again keeping the vocal from getting too harsh and it also again helps us with uh, the compression that we're just just about to get into all right so we have um, the gate then we have um, the de-essing and the next thing that I'm going to put here is an EQ so I'm going to put an EQ in here but we're not going to use EQ yet um, the funny thing is that people are always asking like is it EQ before compression or compression before EQ and what I like to do is I like to actually put the EQ before the compression, but I like to dial in the compression settings first before I go to the EQ, all right? So it's not actually a clear answer. It's like, well, anyway, so that's what I like to do. I'm gonna drop an EQ here, then we're gonna put the compressors, and we're gonna dial in the compression setting, then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna EQ the vocal into the dynamics, into the compression settings. And so for compressors, uh, and. I'm just gonna go ahead and set them up and then we'll come back and, and talk about all this stuff right here. But what we need is I'm gonna get Ableton's standard digital compressor. I'm also gonna get the glue compressor. I'm going to get a, uh, a limiter. Maybe we'll just stop it at the limiter right here. I'll just leave that there, okay? And you know, one more thing, um, and this is all part of the, the pre-planned video, but basically these this is my compression my dynamics module for a vocal. It's gonna be one compressor going into a second compressor. So this is called serial compression. And then we're gonna have a limiter and then we're gonna have a saturator, okay? And so again, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna dial in the compression settings, the dynamic settings first, and then we'll go back and we'll EQ into this. Now, this is a basic vocal chain, so we don't need to go too deep into this. But I do wanna mention that the classic 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 thing to do for processing vocals or compressing vocals is to do what's called like um, an 1176 compressor you might see this on youtube uh, an 1176 compressor into what's called an LA-2A compressor. So this is an 1176 up top and this is an LA-2A compressor and this is a classic compression vocal uh, vocal compression chain 1176 into an LA-2A and the reason why this always comes up over and over and over is very simple i mean it goes back years and years decades really but the reason why it's always this into the la2a is because the 1176 right here is a fast compressor a compressor okay so it, it acts really quickly 
and the LA-2A is a slow compressor. Okay, so we have a fast compressor going into a slow compressor. That's what's going on here. And so what the fast compressor allows us to do is what's called peak control. So if we go ahead and look at the vocals right here, you can see the peaks. So this is pretty loud right here. Look at how quiet this is. Uh, this gets pretty loud. This is loud. I think that's just a repeat of over here. So here's the whole thing. So this is pretty loud, quiet, you know, medium, medium, loud, quiet, you know, so it's, it's a pretty dynamic vocal. So it could definitely use some compression, but what the peak control, what the fast attack compression does, that's what I mean, fast compression. What the fast attack compressor does is it grabs these peaks, okay, and it turns those down. So we're getting peak control, all right? Now, we're just going to use stock Ableton stuff here, which is totally fine. And the way that I want to set up the fast attack compressor here is I'm going to leave the threshold, the, th the ratio here at um, infinity, okay? So that is... A v that's as harsh as a threshold as you could possibly get it. The thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the knee down or technically, I guess, up here to 10. Okay. And the reason why is because the way that a knee works, if I bring this down, as soon as the sound hits the, th the threshold here, it's going to get chopped off by the compressor. So the sound comes up, it gets chopped off by the compressor. With the knee, what happens is as the sound, uh, as the sound comes up, as the sound uh, comes up in volume, it gradually gets hit with more and more compression. So the louder the vocal gets, the more aggressive the uh, threshold gets, okay? And so you can see up here, as the vocal's really loud, the the, th the ratio is just smashing it, right? We're at, we're at infinity to one over here, but as we're a little bit, like maybe right around here, this is more of like a two to one ratio. So the vocal gradually gets hit with compression. And so it's very transparent. We can be very aggressive aggressive, but transparent at the same time. And this is what I'll do every single time. Okay. So this one, this compressor right here is the fast attack compressor. It's the peak control compressor. We're going to control the peaks so that they're not too unruly. Okay. And so that's really it. Um, and now we're just going to bring it down. I mean, we can have a faster attack here a little bit, um, bring it down to 0.5 or so. But Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a So I'm looking for those peaks, okay? So I'm literally just going to set this by eye, okay? And I'm just looking for those peaks to barely tap into that that uh, highest th uh, ratio level right here. Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. So you, you can see when he says stop it, it really hits that flat part. So when he says stop it, that is the most aggressive compression. Everything else is getting slightly compressed, but when he hits stop it, then it's really smashing that vocal. Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking off. Okay, cool. And so that's really it for this compressor. I'm going to change the knee. I don't know why it keeps on changing. There we go. Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon. And so right around there. Now, the cool thing about this compressor is that it has a, a unique way of making up gain or to do it manually. But that's what we have to do. We have to make up the gain. Obviously, a compressor is going to bring the vocal level down because it's taking these peak uh, these peaks here and it's just simply turning them down. And what we could do is we could just look at the LFO tool. I could put an LFO tool on the chain just to monitor the waveform here. So if I open this up, we can see the effects that the compressor has on the audio signal. So if I turn this off, Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. All right, and I'm gonna just going to set the shape here to flat 100. And I'm just going to use this line to draw the peak. Rocket taking off. Rocket. So you can see rocket just hits right there. So that is the peak. Okay. Now if I turn this compressor on, we're going to see this go down. Rocket. See that? Rocket. So that's hitting it pretty hard now. We brought the vocal down by this much. And what we could do is we could actually use the LFO tool to bring the, the volume back up. So I can Rocket I could just take this output here and just kind of boost this until I kind of hit that line again. Rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking off. 
rocket ticking. So right around there. So that would be about level match because I brought rocket back up to the same level it was before. However, um, if you don't use the LFO tool, there's a cool thing that we can do inside of Ableton's compressor. So if you go to the compression, you have these three different modes here. All right. And if we go to the third one, rocket tick. these are just different ways of viewing the how the compressor is behaving. Okay. Rocket ticking you know, off to the moon. And, and so this is just kind of showing the gain reduction over time. But instead of we uh, instead of being on gain reduction, we can change it to output. Rocket ticking. And you can see that the dark gray up here is the input signal, and the white line with the light gray underneath it is the output. Rocket ticking. So you can see the difference. So there's the input up there. There's the output. So we can simply just make up the gain by I if you wanted to. So we could just boost this up a little bit. Rocket tick. Okay, so I could see that there's still a little bit more to go, so I could boost it up a little bit more. Rocket tick, you know. All right, and that seems pretty close to the input. So if I reset the output here. Rocket tick, you know. Okay, you can see there's a difference between the input level and the output level. So if I just bring this back to five. Rocket tick, you know. That seems like we made it back up. So we brought the, uh, the output signal back to the level of the input signal. All right, but the thing is now that we brought down these peaks, but by bringing up the volume, we're bringing up all the low level signal. And that's what a compressor does. It takes a vocal with a dynamic range like this. It just shrinks it down so we can make the whole thing louder. Okay. About a million in the bottom of a rocket ticking you know. off. Okay. So that is our fast attack compressor. Okay. And so this is just peak control. We're just using Ableton's stock compressor and that is basically what you would see if you're going to watch any youtube tutorial on vocal chains or vocal processing you're probably going to come across this but what i want you to understand is that it's not about an 1176 or an la2a it's about a fast attack compressor that's controlling the peaks and then now we're going to get into a slow attack compressor that just levels the vocal out okay so that's what we're going to do now we're going to do the slow attack compression and this is for rms control so the fast attack was for peak control so bringing those high peaks down and then this with the slow attack compression is for rms control so it's going to just crush that vocal even more and it's going to allow us to bring it even further up so it's just going to increase the rms or the loudness or the average level of the vocal which just makes it more present more compressed and more exciting ultimately and so what we're going to use is we're going to use ableton's glue compressor for this and so i'm going to set this up like you would an la2a do not get intimidated by this stuff okay the only thing again i want you to remember is that we have a fast attack compressor going into a slow attack compressor now I'm going to very quickly explain um, the LA-2A, which is, this is called an optical compressor. And the way that an optical compressor works is it once it receives an input, it shines a light. It shines a light once it receives signal. And then there is a light sensor inside this compressor that reads how bright that light is. This is kind of interesting and cool. It reads how light it is, and then it responds by how much it needs to turn the volume down. And so that's why it's called an optical compressor. But because of this, because there's a light that shines, and then there's something that reads that light or detects that light, and then responds, there's a little bit of a delay between the input and then the reaction of the compressor. And that's why this is considered a slow attack compressor. Okay. So, and that's why this one is typically used. And 1176 can act very quickly. Okay. This is a FET compressor. That's not important. I just wanted to break down uh, the slow attack because it's kind of interesting. But again, fast attack compressor, slow attack compressor. All right, and that's what we're using here. So with the slow attack compression, what I'm going to do in the glue compressor is kind of recreate the settings that you would get from an LA-2A or an optical compressor. And so we're gonna have a slower attack time here of about, you can do 30 to 10 milliseconds. I'm gonna do 10 milliseconds. And then we can have a 100 to 200 millisecond release time. That's what we're looking to do here. And on this compressor here, on the first one, I didn't even mention it, but I just almost always leave it on just auto release. Um, you can also turn this off and have a pretty fast release as well, maybe even like 15 to 30 milliseconds, but I just leave it on auto. Okay. So, but for this one, I'm going to have a, a little bit slower. So 100 to 200 millisecond release. And for now, I'll just leave it on 200 millisecond release. A ratio of four is fine. And the only thing I'm looking here in the second compressor is to get about 
uh, uh, hover to get the needle kind of hovering around minus five. Okay, so let's do that. About a million in the bottom of a rocket ticket. And let's go ahead and start doing this in the context of the mix a little bit, just to make it a little bit more exciting. So let's do that. In the bottom of a rocket ticket, no, So just like that, and just like before, what we want to do is make up the gain. Now you can see that the peak value, so here we go from 5 to 10 decibels of gain reduction. So it looks like the max we would get is around 7, so we don't have to be precise about this. I can leak this up about 6 dBs and that should be okay. Now what I want you to see is the difference that this compress these comp compressors make. So if I turn this off, let's look at what the waveform of the vocal looks like, okay? So let's see, the peak value. So you can see the highest, the peak value of the vocal hits kind of around this line in the LFO tool. But then the, the lowest value kind of hits around here. See that? Million, million, the lowest part of the vocal hits here. Now what we're going to see with the compressors, what the compressors do, is they're going to fatten the whole signal up and just make it louder. So we're going to see the vocal pretty much stay pretty consistently uh, loud up at the top. So let's turn these uh, compressors on. You can see how the vocal is now consistently louder than this minimum value line that we just saw on the vocal. And that's what, again, a compressor does. A compressor takes a vocal that has a dynamic range of this, so the low ceiling to the peak value. It compresses it, so it, it moves it into a, a more confined space, and then that allows us to bring the entire volume up. And that's what we're seeing here in the LFO tool. When we monitor the waveform of the vocal, we see the whole thing just get a lot fatter. All right, cool. So that is pretty much the attack, the, the compression that you want to do. You want to first control the peaks, and then you can just use a slow attack compressor here to just control the RMS or the average loudness. And you just want to just, you know, we're getting about 5 to 7 dBs of gain reduction here, and we're just leveling it out, making it even fatter. All right, and so that is compression for vocals in a nutshell. The next thing that I want to do is limiting. Um, now, when it comes to vocals for EDM or like house, you know, because we're doing house and tech house. Um, the thing that I like to think about is disrespecting the vocal because what we want to do, um, there's a little bit of a balancing act that we need to do. We need to create as much headroom in the mix for the uh, kick and the bass because the low end of a house tech house track needs to be really fat and big because we want it to sound huge in the club. These are club tracks. They need to be played in the club. The low end needs to be really big and powerful. But that takes up a lot of headroom in the mix. So when it comes to vocals, we want the vocals to be loud and present. So there's a little bit of a conundrum there. How do we make the vocals loud and present if we don't really have that much headroom to work with or if we really want to create a lot more headroom for the kick and the bass? Well, the answer to that is to disrespect the vocal and just smash it with compression, and then that will allow us to bring the volume up considerably. So it'll be consistently present in the mix. It'll take up a relatively small amount of space because it's uh, so compressed, and that'll open up a lot of space for the kick and the bass. And so that's where ultimately limiting, limiting and uh, saturation, these next two stages are going to come from. These are kind of just the, you can think of these as the corrective kind of um, compression or dynamics for the vocal, but these are going to be the aggressive, disrespectful uh, parts of 
dynamically treating a vogel. So the limiting, we're going to just bring down the peaks even more. And then saturation, we're just going to drive it so hard that it actually starts crunching up and getting a little bit gritty, which is nice because then that adds to the presence of the vocal. Okay. So there's, I really like to do these four different stages of dynamics processing. And remember, this is basic vocal processing. I could go way, way deeper, and I will in a different video, but this is always going to work for you. So now let's uh, do the limiting. And so if you're working in the guillotine mixing style, this is obviously the guillotine mixing course. So this is what I want to show you. You can, the safest benchmark that you could put your vocal at, or even a sound design hook, like a synth, on an individual channel like this. This is an individual channel. The safest benchmark that you can hit for level is negative six, right? So we like to put the kick at zero, and, the, and then what I like to do is I like to put the, uh, the vocals at negative six. So the ceiling value of the vocal is negative six, and that's what this uh, limiter is gonna help me do. So I'm gonna go to negative six here in the ceiling. I'm gonna open up the LFO tool just so I can monitor what's going on here. Now I know from experience that um, negative six, if I change the snap value to eight, is gonna be two clicks down. So this is gonna be the maximum level for the vocal, all right? so. Check this out. So you can see we're getting a lot of gain reduction here in the limiter. And what that means is the compression stages or the vocal is just loud to begin with. And so I'm going to actually bring the gain down into this limiter here. Um, and so that I'm not getting too much gain reduction. And so there we go. So I'm looking that I don't really want to get any more than about negative six dBs of gain reduction. Okay. And so that's what I'm looking for. The ceiling here is the, I love that word. I mean, it's just, it's literally setting a ceiling on the vocal. So the, this limiter is saying, Hey, guess what vocal? You are not going to go above negative six dBs. If you try to go above negative six dBs, I'm turning you back down. And that's exactly what's happening here. And so anytime this vocal goes over negative six, it activates uh, the gain reduction. Now uh, the gain here, this button, this knob really is what turns the vocal up or turns the signal up into that ceiling. Okay, so if I really wanted to drive this hard into negative six, I'd crank this, right? Okay, but I don't want the limiter to be acting that hard. I just want it to do a little bit extra peak control after these two, um, these two compressors. So just a little bit more peak control. So let's bring it back down. So again, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not getting really more than uh, negative six dBs of gain reduction here. So um, next, that's it for the limiter. All right, so the limiter just giving us some extra peak control after these two um, compression stages. The final thing is where we really, really disrespect the vocal, and that's with saturation. So like I said, I like to make sure that the vocal is hitting minus six in the mix. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the soft clip on here. Now I'm going to turn the output to minus five, and I'm going to turn the drive to plus five. So this saturator has an input value of plus five and an output value of minus five. And so it is gain matched right? So plus five in minus five out. So the signal is going to be the same coming in and out. Now, why five? Why not six? And the reason why is because when you turn the soft clip on, the soft clip is going to take an extra dB off. All right. And so that's why. So it says minus five here, but really the output is going to be negative six. So when I play this and we can turn this up a little bit more. And so this is where it gets disrespectful. Okay. So now I'm just going to continue to drive it. So what's happening here with the saturator is I'm just driving into the ceiling and the saturator is much more aggressive than a limiter. Let me show you what I mean. If I turn the limiter um, way up, okay, 
there's not a lot of distortion that gets created with a limiter. But if I turn the saturator way up, okay, by, watch this, be careful with your ears. See that? It's It just distorts the heck out of it, okay? And so, um, that's the thing, is with the saturator, it's just extremely aggressive. So I want to push the saturator as hard as I can to get as much level as I can, but I don't want it to go uh, to distort too much. So let's go ahead and just do that. We're gonna have to do that by ear. Here we go. Okay, very good. And one thing that I'm hearing is that the S's, oh gosh, I turned the de off. I was going to say the S's are a little bit too loud, so we're going to need to go back and turn the uh, them down. But let's listen to that. So I'm going to turn the de off and go ahead and listen to the S's. Especially the stop it, that's a little too harsh. Let's turn the de on. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and actually use the Pro DS because that one is just really nice just for the sake of this tutorial and getting the vocal sounding nice, but you see how to set it up with Ableton's. Cool. And so what I'm turning doing here is Pro DS is great because it's really just put it on and it's going to work because the threshold sit, sits way far back. It's already detecting 7K to 14K here. Um, but the great thing about Pro DS is this range knob. And this range knob just determines like what's the maximum you're going to allow those S's to be turned down. So by default, it's by minus six. But when I feel like the... Um, when I feel like the S's need to be turned down even more, all I need to do is increase the range knob here in the de -esser, and it will continue to turn the S's down even more. All right, and so the max range now that I've set for this is about six and a half to about seven. And so it just turns down those S's just a little bit more. And so what happens is, like I said before, when we use the compressor, uh, the compressors over here, the and then the limiting and the saturation, the entire vocal gets squashed down and it gets brought up. But again, a consequence of that is while the vocal sounds nice and fat, also we're gonna bring those S sounds up. So many, many times I'll have to go back into the de here and just adjust the settings. And typically what I have to do is just simply increase the range knob to continue to turn to continue to turn those S's down in volume. All right, awesome. So there we go. We have a fast attack compression, we have slow attack compression, then we have limiting, and then we have uh, saturation. Okay, so the next thing is we need to go back to the EQ. All right, and the EQ is really fun because we can just completely automate this for you and just make it very, very easy to dial in a vocal. So the first thing I wanna do is get a high pass filter and I'm gonna jump that right to 150. I'm gonna get another high pass filter and I'm gonna jump that to 100 Hertz. Um, but just notice in Ableton, for example, here the one that's at 100 Hertz that's cutting everything below 100 Hertz because everything below 100 Hertz is the club lows and that is reserved for the the kick in the bass. Nothing else is going below 100. And so I'll do a nice uh, kind of gentle high pass with this one right here. Um, and that's just a very nice gentle high pass, removing things as they go below 150. But then um, at, at 100, I just want to have a hard cut. And this is a hard cut right there. You can see this is a times four. So this is a, a 48 pull filter or it's a slope of 48 decibels per octave so every octave we go down then it's just going to chop off 48 decibels which is uh, pretty aggressive all right and so anyway 
So that's what that's the first two things I like to do is just right out of the bat, right out of the gate, have those things set up with the, the two high passes. And then another thing is to put a bell at 300 hertz and then also put one at 2000 hertz. Okay, and so have a filter right uh, a bell right at 300 hertz and then right at 2k. 300 is typically where things get a little bit honky, um, and then 2k is just a really great place to just boost a vocal and make it sound good. The last thing that I like to have is a high shelf going into a low pass filter. So uh, low pass filter, we don't always need, but I, I like to just have it there just in case, because and again, when it comes to uh, house music in particular, we have uh, pretty important high frequency elements like that open hat, that open hat needs to punch through the mix because the open hat serves as the counter punch to the kick. So we have the kick, hat, kick, hat. So pounce, uh, punch, counter punch, pa uh, punch, counter punch. All right. And so sometimes if a vocal has too much air in a house track, especially in a tech house track, we want to maybe remove some of those really high frequencies with a low pass filter. So I'll just throw that in there. And then right here with the, um, the seven, the uh, high shelf, I like to have it kind of around 7K. That's perfect. And if I just need to give a little bit of air, a little bit of shine on the vocal, I can. But I can also just kind of temper the like the super highs by bringing down the low pass filter. And so I get the right balance of high frequencies without getting too in the way of the uh, the high frequency sounds like the open hat and the tops elements. Okay, so really quick, we've got the high pass, we've got the bell at 300, we've got the bell at 2K, we've got the high shelf, and we've got the low pass. And so those are the kind of five things that I like to have. Um, and so in this case, we have a times two, just cutting one cutting off at the 100 hertz. But those are the five things that I like to have for the EQ, uh, just in a basic vocal chain. So now let's kind of uh, boost up the 300 hertz. And what we can do is just fine tune it a little bit. Just try to find a frequency where it's like, oh, that's really loud. Okay. Or that's like way too much. And we can kind of bring that down. Here we go. So right there around 200 hertz. So we start at 300 and I was just kind of looking around and right there at 200 hertz. That's a little bit much. And so what I think we can do is bring that down a little bit. All right, so that's taking it down by about two decibels. And for now, that sounds pretty good to me. Let's try the, the uh, 2K boost and see what we can do here. In the bottom of Again, just kind of sweeping around the 2K area. Really, what you're looking for is anywhere from like 1K to about 5K. But really, what I find is 1K to about 3K is the best place to just kind of do this kind of boost. Another thing is going to open up the queue here just to get a little bit of a wider broadband kind of boost. And let's go ahead and just keep on searching for a nice area to boost. Billion in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you boys can't stop it. And so right there around 2K, I'm at like 1.8. That is really nice. So I'm just going to bring that down and then just kind of boost that up just a little bit. Billion in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon and you Boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking no. All right, now let's do the uh, 7K here. Let's just boost this up, and I'm gonna try to just move this around a little bit to try to find something that sounds good. Billion in the bottom of a rocket taking no to the moon. Now you might be thinking, well, isn't that going to bring up the S's too? And it can, but it, it, so what we might need to do is go back and bring them down even more. But the nice thing is that it's also going to just bring up the general articulation on the vocal and the kind of air and presence of the vocal. And so, yes, it can bring up the S's, but it'll also bring up the nice air that can be on a vocal as well. So what we might need to do is go back and just treat the S's a little bit more. All right. Billion in the bottom of a rocket taking off. To the moon and you boys can't stop it Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking no So bringing down the S's a little bit more Million in the bottom of a rocket taking no To the moon and you boys can't stop it Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking no To the moon and you boys can't stop it Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking no To the moon and you Boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket ticket. All 
All right, let's go ahead and bring the low pass down a little bit too. Building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom, million in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom, million in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom, million in the bottom. All right, cool. And so that sounds pretty good, but again, real simple approach, almost an automated approach to EQ. Just those five things, the high pass, the 300, the 2K, the high shelf, and then the low pass filter. Uh, and for now, let me just reiterate and, and remind you that the way that I like to set this up is I like to put the EQ going into the dynamics. So the EQ going into the two compressors, the limiter and the saturator, but I like to first set the compression settings and then I like to EQ into that, all right? Because this all right here is helping me just clamp down on that vocal and especially these last two, the limiter and the saturator are creating a ceiling. And so if I was going to put the EQ after the dynamics, then that would completely just it would completely undo the ceiling and dynamics ultimately that I created over here. And so I like the feeling of EQing into the chain so I could push the compressor a little bit harder, right? I'm taking away some things, but like with those presence area, I like to, to feel the, the EQ and the vocal being worked harder through the compressors and stuff as I'm EQing. And I really like the pushback that I get from the dynamics from the compressors as I'm uh, adjusting the tone of the vocal with an EQ. And so that's why I like to do it again. Uh, put the EQ first, then the compressors, but for the workflow, start with the dynamics, then go back and shape the tone with the EQ. All right. And so uh, let's go ahead and listen to what we have so far. So I'm going to turn off all of this stuff and let's see what happens here. So here's before. So it definitely sounds better placed in the mix. The the level isn't uh, jumping around, so it feels locked dynamically. Again, it has a better tone. It's a little bit more of the 2K tone. We brought down the, the 300, which really makes it sound woofy and interferes with the bass. And so it just mixed is a lot better. Now, it also sounds a lot louder, but this is going to blow your mind, okay? This is the magic of the dynamic stages. If I turn all this off, Look at how loud, let's look at the peak value of the vocal. Building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom, building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off. So you'll see that stop it hits all the way up here. Okay, this is without the processing. This is with the chain off. Okay, this is the original vocal. The the it's hitting way up here. Building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Look at that, stop it, way, way loud. Now if I turn what we did on, it's gonna go down in volume, but it's gonna sound louder. Okay, watch this. Let's look, let's get the peak value here. Building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon, and you boys can't stop it. Stack the bottom, million in the bottom. Yes, all right. Now, again, this is the beauty of uh, what we're trying to do in a house tech house track, is we want to disrespect the vocal. Okay, because we want to smash it into a nice little space, but also have it present. That's exactly what we've done. Okay, we've we've put the vocal in a nice little tight container and we've lifted it up. We've shaped the tone a little bit and now it just sounds super present, but it's actually quieter than the original. Right. And so that's what I mean by disrespecting the vocal through this uh, dynamics processing. And then the EQ here just helps us shape it to sound a little bit better in the mix. Nine times out of 10, what you're going to be doing is turning down the low mids, so around 300, and you're going to be turning up the vocal presence, which is going to be anywhere from 1K to 5K. Usually it's going to be around 2K. 
And this is uh, something that you could do every single time. Now, there's a couple things that we can do uh, to make this even better that I still feel are uh, fitting for a basic mixing chain for vocals. And the first thing is definitely going to be sidechain compression. So I'm going to go get a, a sidechain compressor here. And I'm going to put it after the LFO tool. Now, this is just Ableton's compressor, but I already ha I put it in a rack, and you can see I turned on the sidechain circuit, and um, and I already have the threshold macroed. And so this is just an audio effect rack, but this is just your standard compressor. So now I just need to get um, my ghost sidechain. So you could use whatever you want. If you want to use the kick from your track, and that's fine. I just happen to have a ghost kick here that I created. You can see that I just a little simpler instrument with a kick on there. And um, I'm going to be using that as the um, as the sidechain trigger for the vocal. So right here, I'm just going to do the ghost sidechain. And uh, one other thing um, is I'm just going to duplicate the compressor here. And so what this means is I'm going to get even more gain reduction per uh, threshold value. So uh, as I turn it down here, then both compressors are going to be acting. So I'm just going to get harder sidechain compress compression without having to, to bring the threshold down too much. All right. But let's go ahead and just get that going. In the bottom of a rocket, the moon. Let's just bring this all the way down just to hear the effect of the sidechain. Vocal just starts bouncing, and that's what we want. We want the vocal to bounce. Okay, if the vocal, the groove is bouncing, right? That's what that's what the groove is supposed to do. It's supposed to make people dance and bounce, right? We want the vocal to have the same movement, because otherwise, the analogy that that I like to think of is if you don't have elements like the vocal bouncing with the groove, then it's kind of like imagining a ship in stormy waters imagine having like an ocean and the ocean is has like stormy waters and then the the boat is just sitting there not moving with the ocean it's very unnatural it's almost creepy and eerie it's like what the heck why is that boat not moving obviously the boat is going to be moving with the ocean and so that's exactly what we want uh, the vocal to do here so we want that vocal to bounce with the groove we want everything to feel integrated all right and we want everything we want everything the groove and the hooks to contribute to that physical movement of people in the club which is just up and down you know just like that so listen to that all right obviously we don't need to go that crazy so let's bring this down a little bit that feel is really nice right there okay and again for me with the ableton compressors i just have auto turned on for the release okay so all i'm doing is really just setting the threshold i do have an infinite ratio the attack time is default okay and that's it Cool. And so that's what I like to do for sidechain compression. There's one other thing that I like to do for sidechain compression, and that's use kickstart. All right. So if I get kickstart. Now, the problem with kickstart and the LFO tool sometimes is they do really, they, they behave really poorly when it comes to uh, plugins that have a lot of sample latency. So, for example, if we look at uh, the limiter down on the bottom left, you'll see it says latency, 64 samples, 1.5 milliseconds. And the LFO tool and kickstart, uh, the signal starts to get pushed back, pushed back in the chain. And so here, um, it might not, the envelope might not uh, attack the vocal in the right spot as the sample latency adds up, especially if you're using like third party plugins. Like if you're using the decapitator or if you're using some kind of ozone um, like Exciter, just any kind of heavy plugins, even Neutron, like those kinds of things are going to really push the, the signal back and the LFO tool and Kickstart don't really handle that. Now in Kickstart, you can have these little buttons to move the curve to find adjust it to, um, to mitigate, you could say, to mitigate the problems of sample latency. But just to completely counteract all that what i like to do is put kickstart at the beginning of the chain so it's responding immediately just to the audio signal it doesn't have to deal 
with any kind of sample uh, latency problems. So we'll just drop it right in the front. I'm gonna put it in front of all these guys just in case. Um, but what I like to do is I, in Kickstart specifically, I like to go to one of these short waveforms, okay? And so I like to have this side chain down here at the end because that gives me a nice bounce. But this Kickstart right here is really just there to make sure I'm really creating enough room for the kick. Okay, and so that's why I like these short ones because I'm really just creating that room for the transient of the kick. So check this out. So here's before. And here's with it. Now you can't even really tell, you know, and that's what's nice, but I could dial this back a little bit so I can pull it back to like, let's say 100. Of course, like everything that I do, I just take it for granted. Almost all the little tools that I have, like sidechain, like LFO tool, or a lot of the third party, I've already created tons and tons of little racks for this stuff. But you can see it's so simple because all I do is just really just macro one knob. In this case, I'm just macroing the mix knob. And that's because um, Ableton allows me to hit up and down on the keyboard and I can move that in fine resolution, which is something that I like to do is really dial something in um, and just press up and down. But anyway, so let's let's dial that in. Here we go. But again, remember what I said is we want to create as much headroom as we possibly can for the kick and the bass. And especially, especially the kick transient. We want that kicked up just basically knock people in the face on the dance floor. And so what this is doing is this is allowing me to create even more space for that kick transient. Boom, just getting that kick to slam. But you can see how awesome it is because I'm able to get um, away with a lot of enveloping, with a lot of gain reduction here with the envelope. Uh, and so that really opens up headroom remember it's a battle for headroom the kick and bass have to win the headroom battle and then it's just a matter of trying to get fit everything else in that's why we squash the vocal with the compressors to really help get those vocals present but not take up too much headroom now what i'm doing is i'm trying to open up even more headroom from the vocal for the kick transient all right and so this is something that i really like doing throwing kickstart at the beginning of the chain and just having a really tight uh, envelope here that makes room for the kick transient. Awesome, that sounds, that sounds great. Okay, cool. Now let's talk about effects, all right? And um, so what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put the effects after the, um, the side chain here now you could put the okay so you could put the effects after the side chain and this is where we're getting into the details but this is the territory that i don't want to go deep into i'll make a separate video for all of this stuff i'll just mention here that of course you could put the effects after the side chain if you want the cool thing about that is that the vocal will bounce but the little effects will kind of float on top of the vocal because they're not bouncing they'll float on top of the groove and that can be a cool effect you just have to try it and see if you like it okay and so you could put the effects after the um, side chain. You could put the effects before the side chain. And effects, we're talking reverb and delay. And so if you put them before the vocal, then or before the side chain, then obviously the effects are going to bounce. And so you might like that. Another thing you could do is put the effects before the dynamics processing. And so what the, um, the dynamics processing is going to do is really just lock in all those effects as well. Because remember, here we have... Um, a limiter and then we have a saturator and these and especially the saturator because it's the last one in the chain is creating that negative 6 db ceiling remember i said i really like to have uh, at least as a starting point to put the vocal at minus six of a ceiling value that's what this is doing right here but if i start loading effects after the saturator the vocal's gonna go up in volume just a little bit. Not too much, because the effects aren't gonna be that loud, but it'll be up in volume a little bit more. Not the biggest deal in the world, but if you do remember, it's a battle for headroom. And so as much headroom as we can get, that's gonna be better. And so, um, yeah, that's why you might wanna even try putting 
the um, the effects before the dynamics processing, or maybe even just before the limiter and the saturator. And then one more little detail here is you can even put the limiter and the saturator after the sidechain plugin, okay? Because then then the the final thing is just a ceiling value. Okay, and that's really, really comforting, at least for me. And so in that case, I could put the effects before the sidechain or after the sidechain, but knowing that everything is going to stay below that negative 6 dB ceiling, and I can always adjust the effects, the volume of the effects. I can always adjust things back here down the line based on how they are responding as they go into that negative 6 dB ceiling. And one, one tiny little thing is at the very end, I'm telling you that the starting point is negative six. That's what the first thing I like to go for. And you can hear right now, it sounds perfect, right? Uh, but if I really wanted to fine tune the level at the end, I would just drop a utility plugin and I could just bring it up or down by one dB, plus or minus one dB. Very rarely is it more than that. Really, it's just fine tuning it within plus one or minus one, okay, depending on what else is going on in the mix. But starting the vocal at minus six for a ceiling is perfect, okay? Now, let's get back to the regular uh, schedule here, <laughs> which is now doing effects, all right? So we're going to look at reverb, we're going to look at delay, and then we're going to look at widening. So this should be pretty quick, but uh, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So with the reverb here, what we're going to do is we're going to create a chain of effects, a bunch of parallel effects. So we're going to have the dry signal of the vocal, and then we're going to run effects in parallel with that dry signal. So it's not like I'm gonna be using the dry wet sig signal to mix the effects in. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit Command G to group this plugin. I'm gonna open up the, the chain and I'm going to uh, create a new chain here. And we're going to just create chains of effects. All right, so here I'm gonna just label this dry because this is the dry signal. This is gonna be, let's say, um, short verb. Okay, and I'm gonna switch the order of that. We're gonna do verb short, okay? And so let's start with that. Let's start with a short reverb. This is also known as a room reverb. And this is great because it just pushes the vocal back from the front of the mix a little bit and adds a little bit of an ambience. So here now that we're on a chain, I'm going to set the dry wet all the way to 100%. And I'm going to turn the diffuse and the reflection all the way up. This is just going to make the reverb a little bit louder. Um, and then when it comes to a room reverb, the only thing we're looking at really is the decay time. So I'm going to pop this right to 500 milliseconds. All right. That's a great starting point for a room reverb. And then the only thing we need to do really is just kind of move the, um, the decay time around plus or minus a little bit just to see what the best decay time is for that sound but it's going to be around 500 it could be 600 could be 700 milliseconds we could even go down to 300 milliseconds but just somewhere around 500 milliseconds that's what we're going to be looking at now to make sure that we can really hear this uh reverb in the mix i'm going to crank the output value here on the chain i'm going to bring that all the way up to six and now let's go ahead and just dial in the reverb settings here so let's let's solo this just so you can hear it maybe we'll do that we'll just we'll listen in solo and i'm going to set the decay time as we're listening in solo So that sounds a little bit better to me. Instead of 500 milliseconds, I'm now sitting around 626 milliseconds. One last thing I wanna do here, and I'm not gonna go do go too deep into it is I want to just restrict the stereo uh, image of it. So there's a stereo knob here on the reverb. But if you just listen, I just want the vocal to go in a little bit, a little bit more down the middle. Here's all the way down the middle. Okay, here's where it was before. So I want to just restrict that just a little bit. Not all the way down the middle, but just restrict it a little bit. So let's start around 80 here. So right there, that sounds pretty nice to me. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and reset the gain here. I'm going to start the short reverb off at minus 12. 
and then I'm going to work that up to see where a nice uh, starting place is. Um, and so let's see what, what it sounds like. Billions in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon. Boys can't stop it. Like the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket. So if I take that away. Billions in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon. Boys can't stop it. Like the bottom million in the bottom of a rocket taking off to the moon just gives it a slightly bigger presence in the mix, just a little bit more of an ambience. The next thing we're gonna look at is a long reverb. So that was a short, what's called room reverb. Next, we're gonna look at a long reverb. And let's do verb long. Now, I'm just keeping this as simple as possible. Short reverb, long reverb. Those always work, right? Just like everything else I showed you in this video, this always, always works. Now we could talk about hall reverbs. We can talk about plate reverbs. We do have videos in the mixing course covering the differences, but at this point, I don't care about any of that. We're talking about a short reverb and a long reverb, all right? So in this case, what we're looking at, it's pretty much any decay time over one second, maybe even two seconds is gonna be kind of what I think as long. So of course, just like before, we're gonna increase the dry wet, we're gonna turn up the diffusion, we're gonna turn up the reflection, and um, yeah, let's go ahead and just dive in and settle in on the decay time. That's all we got to do. And just like before, let's crank the volume and we'll solo it here. And I just want to listen for what's a good feel for a long decay time. Check it out. One last thing. One last thing. When it comes to long reverbs, what I want to do is put an EQ before the reverb just to control the frequencies that are actually going into the reverb and triggering the reverb. So we're going to do the classic, classic thing, which is to set a high pass of 500 and a low pass of 5000. Okay. Again, that's going to work every single time. doesn't matter. Okay. So there we go. We're just restricting the, uh, the reverb specifically to the mid range, 500 to 5k. All right. And none, nothing else is going to trigger that. We can even, uh, this is beyond what I wanted to do, but I'll just go ahead and drop in another aggressive high cut around 200, um, 200 hertz here just to make sure none of that mud down at the bottom is going to get into the vocal okay so let's solo this and let's set a nice long uh, decay time that feels good in the mix That sounds pretty good. Let's go ahead and turn that off. I'm going to start this one off at minus 20 because this is going to be pretty quiet. I just want this to fill out a little bit of the background. And once again, remember that we're running all of this in parallel. So the nice thing is I could just simply turn these off and I get the original. And then I could turn them on one by one, right? So it's nice because I can individually manipulate these. All right, so let's go ahead and let's set the right level for this guy. Okay, so the good rule of thumb for a long reverb like this is set it so that, um, lift it up so that when you hear it, you're like, oh, I can hear that long reverb now. Turn it down just a little bit, okay? You want to set a long reverb to the point where you can't quite hear it, but if you turn it off, it feels like something has gone away. It feel like, feels like the back of the mix has just gone away. So check this out, okay? So let's listen, and I'm going to turn it off. Just watch when I click my mouse here, and then you'll see, uh, you'll just feel something fall away a little bit. All right, so admittedly, that's a little bit subtle. We could we could bump it up a little bit more. Right now, 
right? It just, the vocal doesn't have as much depth when you take away that long reverb. So I'm going to bring that back to minus 16. That was the level that I liked, but that's it for reverb. Okay. We've got a short reverb and we've got a long reverb and those are going to work every single time. Okay. Um, Look, sometimes you you might want to short reverb almost always, almost always. Long reverb, it depends. If you want to have a drier mix, so for example, yeah, if you just want to have like a drier mix, then you don't need a, a long reverb, but you can always try it. You can always try it and then just mix it in from minus 20 or minus 25 or whatever. And if, if it sounds good, just tucked under there barely, then keep it, okay? But if you turn it off and it feels like, yeah, that feels better, then go for that as well, okay? But I'm just showing you the, the tried and true, the things that absolutely work. Now let's cover some delay. So we're gonna drag this in here. And just like before, we're gonna do 100% wet. Um, and I'm also going to restrict the uh, frequency range um, going into it as well. Same thing, 500 to 5K. And we'll bring that down, cool. All right, I'll go ahead and, and jump this up to, okay, to 200. Okay, so just an extra little high pass. Okay, so with de with delay, um, what, what we're looking to do is just kind of enhance the rhythm of the vocal. And the, the two starting points always, especially with um, Ableton's, is just three and two. Okay, so this is a dotted eighth note delay. This is an eighth note. Okay, if, to be honest, I would almost always start my uh, delays on an eighth note. That would be the first thing that I always try first because it just usually is what you end up sticking with. Okay, um, so we have an eighth note here. Um, just in case you don't know, Ableton's delay is set up in terms of 16th notes. So one here would be one 16th note delay. Two would be two 16th notes delay, which is just an eighth note. Three would be three 16th notes delay, which is just, you know, a dotted eighth note because a dotted eighth note is where you take an eighth note and then you add half of its value. So you take an eighth note plus a 16th note. And that's the same thing as 16th note, 16th note, 16th note and that's why we have three we have three 16th notes okay and so a dotted eighth note and then four would obviously be a beat right because there's four 16th note in a beat and but almost all the time i'm going to try usually two and then i'll try three and very very rarely i'll go uh try a four or a one but 90 percent of the time 85 percent of the time it's going to be on a two so let's try that first uh, let's see what that sounds like. Okay, so the next thing to consider is the stereo image of the delay. And Ableton does have a, a more advanced delay. Uh, what's it called? Echo. But for these purposes, we're just trying to keep it simple. So when we're going to do a stereo delay in this case, it's going to we're going to turn the ping pong on. And what ping pong does is it just ping pongs it back and forth, left and right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now let's try the three and let's bring, bring the feedback down. Feedback is how long they bounce back and forth, right? So the lower the feedback, we just get like one delay. You can kind of think of feedback as the a number of repetitions, all right? That's not exactly right. It's, it's technically how much of the signal are you feeding back into the delay, but the practical thing to realize is that it's just how many delays are there. <laughs> So you could hear that when I turned that off, it just kept on going because it was a high feedback. So it was a high number of repeats. But if I had, uh, I have it all the way down on zero, it's just one. So one left, one right, and that's it. Okay. Um, so uh, then it's just dialing in the feedback. Let's just keep it simple and go for 40. Okay. So as I listen to this, what one thing I want to do is you can adjust the filter here. They have their own filter, but you know, I get a little bit more detail when I'm filtering with an EQ into it. And so one thing I want to do is just take away a little bit more into the um, delay here. So I'm just going to lift these guys up and just take a little bit more out. <laughs> 
Okay, that sounds a lot better. I'm gonna bring this down to negative 20 and I'm gonna lift that up as well. Here, that's really quiet, but it, it just helps fill things out. Okay, and so let's turn the ping pong off. Let's see what it sounds like down the middle. That sounds pretty good too. It makes it sound a little bit spacier, but we kind of already have these reverbs here. So uh, I, I really like the stereo effect that the ping pong is giving. So instead of having that kind of down the middle reverb, I like the ping pong because it just gives it this nice presence in the stereo image, right? We've covered the depth dimension with the reverbs, especially the long reverb. The long reverb has us covered back there. But what I want to do is I want to add in a nice kind of movement in the stereo image. And so I, I'm going to select, in this case, the ping pong delay. That sounds pretty good. Okay, next up, we're going to look at a couple of things that we can do for width. All right, so starting with delay, I'm going to actually use a delay to show you a cool way to create a little bit of width. And let's just actually name this delay. And um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna label this Pong, P-O-N-G, just so I know this is a ping pong reverb. Next, we're gonna do uh, wide and then D-L-Y. Okay. So uh, for to create width in a delay, what I wanna do here is, I'm going to turn the dry wet all the way up. I'm going to turn ping pong on. And then what we're going to do is really fast delays on the left and the right. Really fast delays. So we're going to do the ping pong so we get a quick left and a quick right. But I need to change this from sync down to the time value. And I'm going to bring these all the way down. And so check this out. So let's turn this way up. So boom, instant kind of width there. And then we can lift this up a little bit. Alright, and so that's bouncing left and right, and so you hear the, the left side is biased a little bit. Um, I'm just going to show you something really uh, silly really quick, which is if you wanted to switch where that is biased, you could just uh, get a utility and go to swap. And now the, the delay is mostly going to be is you're going to hear it first on the right. So I turn that off. It's going to go back to the left. And that's because your ear hears the left signal first. OK, but both the left and the right are playing. So it's balanced in the stereo dimension just to let you know. But what we want to do is just, we just want to mix this in a little bit so we don't have to get crazy with this stuff. I'm going to do the same thing as before here. Let's just quickly bump this up to like 1000. Let's see what that sounds like. So instead of 500, let's go up to 1000 and then let's bring this down to 5k. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and mix that in. And let's turn everything on here. Let's see. Okay, let's turn everything else off here. Except for the dry. So it creates a really, really cool and interesting stereo effect when we add that in like that. And I actually turned it up a little bit. All right, turning it down just a little bit there down to negative two. Another way that we can make something wide is just um, a chorus. 
plugin. All right, and there are there are other ways to make something sound wide. Like this wide delay trick is very similar to the Haas effect. Um, so the Haas effect is where you would have the dry signal left and then a delayed signal right or vice versa. So the dry signal right and then a delayed signal left. And so this is very, very similar to what's going on with the Haas effect. So I'm not going to cover that, but uh, I will cover another technique, which because this is pretty much the Haas effect right here um, anyway. And so another thing that we're going to do is cover a chorus. OK, so I'm going to drop a chorus in here and then we'll do wide chorus all right and so this one's fun so let's go ahead and solo this and i'm going to turn the dry wet all the way up i'm going to turn the warm up because with the warm up it gives a low pass filter on there so it takes out the the top end um, and then let's go ahead and turn this on ensemble okay and we're going to turn the width all the way up so these are kind of the default settings here i'm going to turn the feedback up a little bit but you can see that this really introduces a very cool stereo effect because chorus is just going to make it go wow 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 all right and so i'm also going to turn on this high pass here and let's just kind of mix out the low end too all right, right around there, about 500. All right, next thing I'm going to mess with here is the amount of the chorusing. So I'm going to crank the amount, and I'm just going to set a, a rate here because I want to, you know, what the rate here is going to introduce how much urgency you're bringing into the sound. Check it out. All right, so let me reset these here just so we can hear that. So here's before. So that's a very nice, smooth chorus. But if I want to increase the urgency, the emotion, I can crank the amount. And then I can play with the rate here to see how fast I want that. All right, I like that. So I'm going to reset the amount and just dial it up until it sounds good. All right, I like that. We can mix that in. So let's start this around minus 12 and we'll mix that in. All right, but you can kind of see now why I was saying before you can put these things before the limiter. And of course, you don't have to have things crazy stacked up like this. You certainly don't need to. I mean, if I wanted to, I could try putting the chorus. Uh, let's put the, let's just throw the chorus in before the limiter and the saturator. I'm going to turn in this case. I'm going to turn the, the dry wet down, though. OK, I'm going to turn it all the way zero and then I'm going to lift it up a little bit. Okay, so let's check it out. Okay, that's a little bit subtle, but I, I think it sounds great, you know, but that's just something that you could do. I'm going to move this back onto the chorus here and we'll remove this and there we go okay so let's go ahead and just double check our, our reference sheet over here um, delay let's let's not look at, at that that we don't need to chorus a delay fast pong so it looks like we covered everything here um, we looked at uh, Ableton's delay and we looked at uh, you know the different rates that we can use so usually usually eighth or uh, dotted eighth okay and then we looked at just keeping it mono or stereo in this case this was just we just did a pong reverb and then obviously to make the vocal wider we looked at width and then also the um, fast pong okay so we covered everything that I wanted to cover in this basic vocal mixing chain and what I want to do now is just let's listen to the before and after
Okay, so uh, I'm going to get rid of the stuff that we're not using really quick. So let's get rid of these guys. And it looks like everything else we're using. So, okay. So let's look at before and after. So here's before. Building in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon. Boys can't stop it. Stuck about a million in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon. Boys can't stop it. Stuck about a million in the bottom of a rocket, taking off to the moon. Boys can't stop it. Stuck about a million in the bottom of All right, so sounds way better i've uh, we've drowned it in effect so this is a little bit more uh, effecty than i would like it to be but let's turn off the let's let's turn off some of these effects here i'm going to turn off everything but the long reverb the short reverb and uh let's see what that sounds like so let's turn everything off so this is before here's before Awesome. And so that is a basic vocal mixing chain that will always, always work. I'm just going to quickly run through what we did. We started with a uh, gate. In this case, I didn't want to uh, use it, but you can always use it just to remove any kind of noise floor or any noise that's underneath your vocal. Then we moved into de-essing because we want to get rid of those harsh um, S's because they can make the vocal very unpleasant to listen to and very harsh and grating. And you don't. And on huge club systems, when you have those harsh frequencies going into people's ears, you don't want to make them go deaf. So uh, gating and then de-essing. And then we dumped a bunch of dynamics processors on here. We looked at two compressors, a fast attack compressor that controls peak, and then a slower attack compressor that kind of just, that just squeezes down on everything and just increases, allows us to increase that RMS. So it's kind of more of like a body compression. So this is like peak level compression. This is body compression. Um, Peak compression and RMS. One of the things that uh, the compressor has actually, instead of detecting peaks, you can actually detect RMS. So you can use the compressor to compress not just peaks, but RMS. And so we could use also the digital compressor to do this more RMS style um, compression. But I also wanted to throw in the glue compressor here. It's a great compressor. And so we have the fast attack compression. We have the slow attack RMS compression. And then here we have our limiting. We have the limiter just to clip off a little bit more peaks. And then we have the saturator to drive the vocal up into the 6 dB ceiling while adding grit and just disrespecting the vocal. All right. So that we can we can clamp down on the vocal and open up even more headroom for the kick and the bass while still making sure the vocal is present. And then after dynamics, what we did is a basic EQ using five simple things. We have our high pass. We have our 300 bell. We have our 2K bell. We have our high shelf that just lifts the air a little bit. And then we have the low pass just to make sure that we're uh, not encroaching on the space of the high frequency elements in the drums uh, in particular. All right, so dynamics, then EQ into the dynamics, and that's gonna be a, a vocal mixing chain that you cannot go wrong with. It will always, always, always work. And again, the beautiful thing is, when you set that uh, 6 dB ceiling, minus 6 dB ceiling in guillotine mixing, that is a perfect benchmark to set your vocal at when you start going. And then you can always just readjust it later on, uh, plus a little bit, minus a little bit, but 6 dB is a great starting point. And most times, I would say six or seven times out of 10, I, I don't adjust the vocal, the final vocal volume whatsoever from that ceiling value. All right. 
Um, and then, of course, what we did is sidechain compression. We just looked at standard sidechain compression to make that vocal bounce. And I also showed you a little bit of a detail here with the kickstart, just to make sure that we're creating even more headroom. See how much we can get away with with uh, ducking the vocal underneath that kick transient, because that's just going to allow that kick to smack people in the club uh, and smack them in the face. All right. And the final thing was just looking at just some standard, standard effects that you can use in the vocal. So we just use the Ableton audio effects racks to do this so we can run all the effects in parallel with the dry signal. So here's the dry signal just going right to the output. And then we have this uh, kind of chain of, of effects. We looked at some short reverb, AKA a room reverb. Then we did a nice long reverb, okay? Not going into the details of plate or hall, just a long reverb that just sounds good and fills out the back of the mix. Then we did a pong, uh, 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 we did a delay, okay, which just enhances the rhythm of the vocal ultimately. Then we had a wide delay uh, effect, or we added some width using a fast delay right here. And this just gives a really cool stereo effect to any kind of vocal. And then another thing we looked at was using chorus to widen the vocal. But that pretty much covers everything. If you have anything that you uh, want to ask, definitely leave a comment below this video. If you have something that you want to add to what I talked about here, then definitely leave it in the video. But I'll see you in the next video.